April 28. Absalom's Rebellion After this, Absalom bought a chariot and horses, and he hired fifty bodyguards to run ahead of him. He got up early every morning and went out to the gate of the city. When people brought a case to the king for judgment, Absalom would ask where in Israel they were from, and they would tell him their tribe. Then Absalom would say, You've really got a strong case here. It's too bad the king doesn't have anyone to hear it. I wish I were the judge. Then everyone could bring their cases to me for judgment, and I would give them justice. When people tried to bow before him, Absalom wouldn't let them. Instead, he took them by the hand and kissed them. Absalom did this with everyone who came to the king for judgment, and so he stole the hearts of all the people of Israel. After four years, Absalom said to the king, Let me go to Hebron to offer a sacrifice to the Lord and fulfill a vow I made to him. For while your servant was at Geshur and Aram, I promised a sacrifice to the Lord in Hebron if he would bring me back to Jerusalem. All right, the king told him, go and fulfill your vow. So Absalom went to Hebron. But while he was there, he sent secret messengers to all the tribes of Israel to stir up a rebellion against the king. As soon as you hear the ram's horn, his message read, you are to say, Absalom has been crowned king in Hebron. He took 200 men from Jerusalem with him as guests, but they knew nothing of his intentions. While Absalom was offering the sacrifices, he sent for Ahithophel, one of David's counselors, who lived in Gilo. Soon many others also joined Absalom, and the conspiracy gained momentum. David escapes from Jerusalem. A messenger soon arrived in Jerusalem to tell David, All Israel has joined Absalom in a conspiracy against you. Then we must flee at once, or it will be too late. David urged his men, Hurry, if we get out of the city before Absalom arrives, both we and the city of Jerusalem will be spared from disaster. We are with you, his advisors replied. Do what you think is best. So the king and all his household set out at once. He left no one behind except ten of his concubines to look after the palace. The king and all his people set out on foot, pausing at the last house to let all the king's men move past to lead the way. There were six hundred men from Gath who had come with David, along with the king's bodyguard. Then the king turned and said to Idai, a leader of the men from Gath, Why are you coming with us? Go on back to King Absalom, for you are a guest in Israel, a foreigner in exile. You arrived only recently, and should I force you today to wander with us? I don't even know where we will go. Go on back and take your kinsmen with you, and may the Lord show you his unfailing love and faithfulness. But Idai said to the king, I vow by the Lord and by your own life that I will go wherever my lord the king goes, no matter what happens, whether it means life or death. David replied, All right, come with us. So Idai and all his men and their families went along. Everyone cried loudly as the king and his followers passed by. They crossed the Kidron Valley and then went out toward the wilderness. Zadok and all the Levites also came along, carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. They set down the Ark of God, and Abiathar offered sacrifices until everyone had passed out of the city. Then the king instructed Zadok to take the Ark of God back into the city. If the Lord sees fit, David said, he will bring me back to see the Ark and the tabernacle again. But if he is through with me, then let him do what seems best to him. The king also told Zadok the priest, Look, here is my plan. You and Abiathar should return quietly to the city with your son Ahimeaz and Abiathar's son Jonathan. I will stop at the shallows of the Jordan River and wait there for a report from you. So Zadok and Abiathar took the ark of God back to the city and stayed there. David walked up the road to the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered and his feet were bare as a sign of mourning. And the people who were with him covered their heads and wept as they climbed the hill. When someone told David that his advisor Ahithophel was now backing Absalom, David prayed, O Lord, let Ahithophel give Absalom foolish advice. When David reached the summit of the Mount of Olives where people worshipped God, Hushai the archite was waiting there for him. Hushai had torn his clothing and put dirt on his head as a sign of mourning. But David told him, If you go with me, you will only be a burden. Return to Jerusalem and tell Absalom, I will now be your advisor, O king, just as I was your father's advisor in the past. Then you can frustrate and counter Ahithophel's advice. 
Zadok and Abiathar the priests will be there. Tell them about the plans being made in the king's palace, and they will send their sons Ahimeaz and Jonathan to tell me what is going on. So David's friend Hushai returned to Jerusalem, getting there just as Absalom arrived. David and Ziba When David had gone a little beyond the summit of the Mount of Olives, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, was waiting there for him. He had two donkeys loaded with two hundred loaves of bread, one hundred clusters of raisins, one hundred bunches of summer fruit, and a wineskin full of wine. What are these for? the king asked Ziba. Ziba replied, The donkeys are for the king's people to ride on, and the bread and summer fruit are for the young men to eat. The wine is for those who become exhausted in the wilderness. And where is Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson? the king asked him. He stayed in Jerusalem, Ziba replied. He said, Today I will get back the kingdom of my grandfather Saul. In that case, the king told Ziba, I give you everything Mephibosheth owns. I bow before you, Zeba replied. May I always be pleasing to you, my lord the king. Shimei Curses David As King David came to Bahurim, a man came out of the village cursing them. It was Shimei, son of Gera, from the same clan as Saul's family. He threw stones at the king and the king's officers and all the mighty warriors who surrounded him. Get out of here, you murderer, you scoundrel, he shouted at David. The Lord is paying you back for all the blood shed in Saul's clan. You stole his throne, and now the Lord has given it to your son Absalom. At last you will taste some of your own medicine, for you are a murderer. Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Abishai, son of Zeruiah, demanded. Let me go over and cut off his head. No, the king said. Who asked your opinion, you sons of Zeruiah? If the Lord has told him to curse me, who are you to stop him? Then David said to Abishai and to all his servants, My own son is trying to kill me. Doesn't this relative of Saul have even more reason to do so? Leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to do it. And perhaps the Lord will see that I am being wronged and will bless me because of these curses today. So David and his men continued down the road, and Shimei kept pace with them on a nearby hillside, cursing as he went and throwing stones at David and tossing dust into the air. The king and all who were with him grew weary along the way, so they rested when they reached the Jordan River. Ahithophel advises Absalom. Meanwhile, Absalom and all the army of Israel arrived at Jerusalem, accompanied by Ahithophel. When David's friend Hushai the Archite arrived, he went immediately to see Absalom. Long live the king, he exclaimed. Long live the king! Is this the way you treat your friend David? Absalom asked him. Why aren't you with him? I'm here because I belong to the man who is chosen by the Lord and by all the men of Israel, Hushai replied. And anyway, why shouldn't I serve you? Just as I was your father's advisor, now I will be your advisor. Then Absalom turned to Ahithophel and asked him, What should I do next? Ahithophel told him, Go and sleep with your father's concubines, for he has left them here to look after the palace. Then all Israel will know that you have insulted your father beyond hope of reconciliation, and they will throw their support to you. So they set up a tent on the palace roof where everyone could see it, and Absalom went in and had sex with his father's concubines. Absalom followed Ahithophel's advice just as David had done. For every word Ahithophel spoke seemed as wise as though it had come directly from the mouth of God. Now Ahithophel urged Absalom, Let me choose twelve thousand men to start out after David tonight. I will catch up with him while he is weary and discouraged. He and his troops will panic, and everyone will run away. Then I will kill only the king, and I will bring all the people back to you as a bride returns to her husband. After all, it is only one man's life that you seek. Then you will be at peace with all the people. This plan seemed good to Absalom and to all the elders of Israel. Hushai counters Ahithophel's advice. But then Absalom said, Bring in Hushai the archite. Let's see what he thinks about this. When Hushai arrived, Absalom told him what Ahithophel had said. Then he asked, What is your opinion? Should we follow Ahithophel's advice? If not, what do you suggest? Well, 
Hushai replied to Absalom. This time Ahithophel has made a mistake. You know your father and his men. They are mighty warriors. Right now, they are as enraged as a mother bear who has been robbed of her cubs. And remember that your father is an experienced man of war. He won't be spending the night among the troops. He is probably already hidden in some pit or cave. And when he comes out and attacks, and a few of your men fall, there will be panic among your troops, and the word will spread that Absalom's men are being slaughtered. Then even the bravest soldiers, though they have the heart of a lion, will be paralyzed with fear. For all Israel knows what a mighty warrior your father is, and how courageous his men are. I recommend that you mobilize the entire army of Israel, bringing them from as far away as Dan in the north and Beersheba in the south. That way you will have an army as numerous as the sand on the seashore, and I advise that you personally lead the troops. When we find David, we'll fall on him like dew that falls on the ground. Then neither he nor any of his men will be left alive. And if David were to escape into some town, you will have all Israel there at your command. Then we can take ropes and drag the walls of the town into the nearest valley until every stone is torn down. Then Absalom and all the men of Israel said, Hushai's advice is better than Ahithophel's, for the Lord had determined to defeat the council of Ahithophel, which really was the better plan, so that he could bring disaster on Absalom.'"